Imagine if your local bus would not accept pound coins because the bus driver thought they were worthless pieces of metal. Or imagine if the ride-sharing app that you used to come here tonight would not drop you off at your destination unless you agree to share all your mobility history with your business partners. Or imagine if in the most recent London local election, you had to take your birth certificate down to the polling station to prove your identity. And even then, they'd want to call your mother to verify that you are who you say you are. All of these transactions rely on one thing, trust. Trust that the pound coins are backed by the Bank of England as legal currency. Trust that your movements won't be unnecessarily tracked and shared. And trust that your digital identity card actually represents who you are. Trust is fundamental to the fluid functioning of human society. It reduces friction and enables us to have relationships of all kinds, from commerce to governance. Early in human history, place and locality were critical to our sense of trust. We trusted those people who lived nearby us and people who we knew. If there was a problem, we knew where to find them, and social pressure obliged them to change their behavior. But as we moved farther away from home and started transacting and interacting with strangers, we had to develop institutions to reduce uncertainty. For example, in Renaissance Italy, we developed banking and financial products to facilitate trade with faraway lands. And in the 19th century, we developed government-issued passports to verify identity. Even today, we rely on many forms of intermediaries to validate trust. For example, auditors, bankers, brokers, lawyers, and real estate agents. But the internet changed how we trust and communicate. And I believe in the near future, new technologies will automate trust, reduce our need for middlemen, and decouple our sense of trust from our attachment to place. Let me explain how I've come to this conclusion. 18 years ago, I was living in London House, this very same building from where I'm speaking to you now, and I was a student of international relations at the London School of Economics. By daytime, I was studying sovereignty and political trust, and at nighttime, I was exploring e-commerce and digital trust. This was the heyday of the internet, and very early stages. This is what we now call web version 1.0. Information was easily accessible online, and we knew everything we read online to be actually true. Entrepreneurs all around me were building transformative e-commerce business models that they thought were sure bets for success, including companies like Pets.com. Now, I too wanted to have an impact for my immediate community, so I created a website that helped graduating students find jobs. It was called DesperateStudent.com. <laughs> Surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, the project wasn't a huge success, possibly because people didn't trust my online branding. So I put my head down, and a few years later, I found myself deep in another startup. This time, an e-commerce company that sold kite surfing equipment online. We had a really innovative business model. We sold directly to consumers, bypassed the middlemen in our supply chain, and passed the cost savings to consumers in the form of lower prices, and they loved us but everybody else in the industry hated us, and they banned us from every single industry event. Now, if you remember the early days of e-commerce, you weren't quite sure if it was safe to trust your credit card information online for shopping. But without digital trust, e-commerce would be impossible, whether for a small kite surfing company or a giant like eBay. And by the mid-2000s, we gradually learned that not everything we learned on the internet was true, 
and that we couldn't trust every Nigerian prince that we met online. So we gravitated to online platforms that facilitated trust, that streamlined e-commerce, and that encouraged social interaction. This was web version 2.0, and it allowed us to trust people and do things that we would never have historically done before. For example, getting into a random, perfect stranger's car and asking for an Uber ride instead of using our beloved London taxis. Or renting a room in a stranger's house on Airbnb instead of staying at a trusted hotel. I think that we are on the verge of a new era in the internet. And in this new era, transactions will occur directly, peer-to-peer, -peer, and without the need for middlemen or centralized platforms that have historically acted as gatekeepers of trust. We are going from an internet of information and commerce to an internet of trust and value. And in this web version 3.0, online collaboration will be distributed across a network and won't be subject to traditional hierarchy. And this will be done largely on the backbone of a technology called blockchain. Now, you may have heard this buzzword, so let me try to explain it as simply as possible. A blockchain is a distributed database of information stored in duplicate across thousands of computers across the world. Every time a new piece of information is added to this database, what we call a block, computers around the world encrypt this data privately and add it securely to all the previous blocks in the database, hence the term blockchain. And once a new block is created, it becomes unchangeable because every subsequent block is built on the encrypted data of all the previous blocks, just like a giant besting doll. So you can essentially imagine the blockchain to be a permanent database that will allow you to either store digital information, like birth certificates, or digital value, like virtual currencies. So you might ask, what does this have to do with trust? Well, the blockchain is decentralized. What that means is that there's no central authority that manages it. And trust is determined by the entire community consensus and by virtual currencies which you may have heard of, like Bitcoin and Ether. And they're not the only two virtual currencies. There are thousands of others being used right now to develop applications that don't rely on intermediaries or even humans for trust. So what happens when we automate trust? Well, number one, we're going to piss off a lot of people. A lot of people who right now rely on their roles as intermediaries, middlemen, and gatekeepers of trust. And believe me, they will fight tooth and nail not to be bypassed, just like they did in the kitesurfing industry. And number two, and more importantly, we are going to empower every citizen to take control of their digital lives and own their data on the internet. So remember the three scenarios I introduced at the beginning of this talk. Let's explore what they look like in the very near future. The bus driver accepts your pound coins because he trusts that the Bank of England has deemed this as legal currency. But virtual currencies don't rely on the backing or trust of any central bank, and that's by design. Virtual currencies derive their value from scarcity and limited supply, just like gold, which also isn't regulated by central bank, but our society thinks it has value. The blockchain and virtual currencies allow us to access new ways of capital and release new ways of value. So in the future, when you ride the bus, you may not pay the fare using pound sterling. You may pay it using a digital currency. And you probably earned that digital currency as a reward 
for having done something deemed socially valuable. For example, volunteering to take care of the elderly, or reducing your carbon footprint or water consumption. And what about the ride-sharing app that has all your mobility data? Let's hypothetically say you live in a country who doesn't like your political opinions, and the government wants to track you to better understand your relationships. Well, in an authoritarian country, the ride-sharing app probably doesn't have much choice but to share that data with the state. And while this is more difficult in democracies, even democracies can pressure technology firms to get access to encrypted data behind closed doors. But if that ride-sharing app was built on blockchain technology, your mobility data could not be accessed by those for whom it was not intended. That's because there's no central authority to subpoena for the documents or to sue. So you can trust the blockchain to keep your data private and your information uncensorable. And when you go vote in the future, you'll be able to do it online securely, as opposed to going down to the polling station and queuing and showing a piece of paper that could have been forged. We can build blockchain-based identity systems that will allow you to vote online securely from anywhere. And if you think this is far-fetched, Estonia, which is the world's most advanced digital nation, already has blockchain-based identity systems and allows all of its citizens to vote online securely, in addition to a whole host of other government services. So in case you're jealous, you can become an Estonian e-resident and access the same kind of services using this blockchain-based identity system, even if you don't live in Estonia or the European Union, which most of you won't next year. In the future, blockchain technology will radically alter our familiar relationships with place, institutions of trust, and even economic value. And when trust becomes automated and increasingly transparent, I believe that we'll be able to express our humanity freely, anytime, anywhere, and without fear of ownership, censorship, or reprisal. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the true promise of the internet. Thank you.